The next thing I want to do is go back to this issue of phase leading phase change leading to a decrease in signal amplitude right in the presence of flow. So we already said earlier on that if we have spins that are moving through the slice along the direction of one of our applied gradient magnetic fields that there is going to be a decrease in signal intensity after a period of time that is greater than the amount of signal intensity that would have been lost if the spins were stationary. And we talked about ways to adjust our frequency encoding gradient magnetic fields to recover some of that signal lost. So it turns out that when I discussed the fact that the change in phase was related to the square of the time and that that was the case for constant velocity flow. Right, so this is a simplification and there is another right, factor in this relationship which actually is the velocity. Right. So based on the velocity of the flow we will have an alteration in the amount of change in phase and therefore the amount of change in signal intensity. And it turns out that in order for us to turn on our frequency encoding gradient magnetic fields, let's say, to maximally compensate for the signal change resulting from phase change that occurs in the presence of flow, that one of the considerations here is velocity. That with, when we turn on our we discussed a scheme, for example, that looked like this, which we said would maximally refocus constant velocity flow. Okay. Well, that's true, right? But it does depend to some extent on the actual velocity of the flow. And I was giving you a simplified example based on, you know, some presumed expected arterial velocity. But if there are significant differences in velocity, the actual magnitude of the phase shift change, changes. What that means is that if we want to, for example, look at some piece of anatomy, so let's say we're looking at the head, and there are various types of flow in the head. We have arteries, right? Uh, there are veins, right? there's venous sinuses, and there's also flow of right, cerebrospinal fluid. All of these things flow at different velocities. We tend to think of arterial velocities being the highest, venous a little bit lower, and CSF velocity being much lower. Uh, it actually kind of depends. Depends on what veins you're talking about, for example. The flow velocities in the suprasagittal sinus are pretty similar to arterial velocities. If, you ever, if you've ever been, if you're in the OR and you see them nick the suprasagittal sinus, it's like amazing how rapidly that black blood comes flowing out of there. So if we want to set up a scan so that we maximally compensate for the phase change loss of signal resulting from, from flow, we need to know something about that velocity. And we can actually make an image which is specifically designed to assess whatever that flow velocity is that we're interested in. Right. So we could set up our image with a right, pair of gradient magnetic fields with the correct gradient amplitudes to compensate 
the phase shift caused by flow that was going, let's say, 10 centimeters per second. So if we were interested in making an image where we were particularly sensitive to a specific type of flow, it's simply a matter of setting up these gradient magnetic fields in a way that works for that. And typically in the pulse sequence, what we will actually do is not, it's not just a matter of dealing with the <coughs> frequency encoding gradient, but there is an extra gradient magnetic field applied. So this is our, oh, that wasn't good. So if we have our right 90 degree RF pulse, TE is over here. And this is our slice select gradient, right? Phase, frequency. So we have our slice selective RF pulse, some phase encoding, and then we have over here our frequency encoding gradient. So let's say that we're interested in detecting flow at some velocity. Well, we can turn on an additional application of a gradient magnetic field that is designed to optimally refocus that velocity. Other velocities will not be maximally compensated by this gradient combination. So there's a net zero effect on a specific velocity. Anything outside of that velocity has a non-zero phase shift or undergoes signal loss. The resulting signal that we sample is therefore Right? sensitive specifically or has more signal from flow moving at this specific velocity. Is that clear what we're saying here? Sort of, maybe, yes, no? Does it cause dephasing of static tissue, that tissue that isn't moving? Okay, so these gradients are designed, right, to maximally compensate flow at a specific velocity. So they are not optimized to compensate non-moving spins. So in that image, right, in this image, we will have higher signal from flow moving at velocity whatever we chose than everything else, including other velocities of motion as well as background stationary spins. Okay, and the parameter that tells us what velocity it is that we're sensitizing to is called the velocity encoding or VENC. Now in this example, what direction of flow will we detect? Any direction? Okay. Anyone agree? Disagree? What do you say? Well, the gradient magnetic field was applied using the frequency encoding gradient. What we're detecting is our ability to refocus phase shifts that occur along the direct due to motion along the direction of this gradient magnetic field. It's only motion along the frequency encoding direction that we will be sensitive to. Because movement along some orthogonal direction, let's say the phase encoding direction, during that movement, the spin see exactly the same strength of this gradient magnetic field. Is that clear why that is? Yes, no, no? Let's just clarify this. If this is our image, right, image of whatever it happens to be, this is the frequency encoding direction, right? This is the phase encoding direction. So in our example here, we did this sensitization. We turned on this frequency encoding gradient. That means that we have a gradient magnetic field left to right, which means that as spins move along, flow, right, our old example in the splenic vein or artery, let's say, as they move from left to right, 
they see progressively increasing amounts of field strength because this is a gradient magnetic field in this direction. Is that clear? And that results in a net accumulation of phase. Yes, no? If there's movement in this direction, as thing, no matter how far they move along the, along the up and down dimension of this image, right, we see the same amount of gradient strength. It doesn't change. So there is no accumulation of phase because things are seeing exact, the spins see exactly the same field strength all the way along here. Okay, when we talked this morning about that business of phase accumulating as a quadratic, as the square of time, that was only along the direction of the gradient magnetic field. When we move in this direction, while this gradient is on, there is no gradient magnetic field. There's no gradient of magnetic field strength in this direction. Okay, so in this example, we have only sensitized this image to flow along one dimension. So unless there's movement along the, the frequency encoding direction in this image, we're not going to detect it. We could start from scratch, do this all over again, and apply the phase encoding gradient some extra time to maximally compensate flow along the phase encoding direction. That would be a separate iteration, a separate image that's now sensitive to flow going in the orthogonal direction. So our first time around, we might be sensitive to this flow right, in the splenic artery. And our second time around, we might be sensitive to flow, I don't know, in the celiac or the SMA that's going from front to back. But when we did this with our flow sensitization along the frequency encoding, we wouldn't detect anything in that SMA and vice versa. Now, could we just do all of this at the same time? Because if I have both of these gradients on during a single acquisition, then don't we have sensitization to flow in both directions? Is it an effector or something? Right, so if these two gradient magnetic fields are on at the same time, what we're essentially doing is applying the sum, the vector sum of those two gradient magnetic fields. So we would generate an image that would correctly compensate flow at whatever velocity we had chosen along that oblique direction. So if we want to generate an image right, where we can see flow in any direction, it's not very useful to have an image where you can only see flow along one linear direction. Because typically arteries and veins are, even CSF is tortuous, it moves in different directions. So if we want to generate an MRA image that shows us everything, we would need to repeat this three separate times. Right? Once with sensitization along each of the three orthogonal directions. And then we have to take those images and combine them together into a single image. Typically what happens is we actually acquire four images. Right? One of them which has no flow, one which has flow along X, one with flow along Y, and one with flow along Z. And there's a complex subtraction of all those images which gives us something that shows us flow in all directions. But shows us only flow at a specific velocity. Okay? Now notice in this example that the requirement for us to detect the presence of flow is that there has to be motion at the correct velocity. It has nothing to do with how much longitudinal magnetization there is or saturation or anything like that. Stationary spins are not going to be correctly 
refocused by this gradient application. And as a result, the contrast to noise, so to speak, or the difference in signal between flow and the background in this type of approach is extremely high. Right? Our background suppression in this approach, which is called phase contrast, if I didn't say it, MRA is, is excellent. And we don't have to rely on doing things like saturating background signal. It's a combination of the images inherently only being sensitive to flow, as well as the fact that we're doing the subtraction, which includes taking away an image that's not flow sensitized. The problem, the downside, is potentially two things. One is that it takes a really long time to do this. Okay. The other is that we have to choose our velocity carefully. Right. Depending on the velocity you choose, you will be excluding even flowing signal from your image if it's flowing at a velocity that's outside of the range that you've selected. Okay. So in practice, I mean in real life in terms of why we bother to use this, you know, why don't we do this all the time? It has great background suppression. So the biggest drawback is that it takes so long to do. Uh, the reasons why it is beneficial are a couple of things. First of all, we potentially have the ability to actually quantify the flow. We talked on I think on Monday, about this idea of imaging with a quadrature coil and being able to generate an image called a phase image. We can actually measure these phase shifts right, and quantify flow. And this is actually used in cardiac imaging. So if you want to look, for example, at the flow velocity across the aortic valve and try and make a decision as to whether it looks like it's a high, you know, a critically high degree of stenosis or something like that. Or if you want to look at CSF flow velocity, I'll show you an example of this. You can do that simply by quantifying flow. The other thing you can do with phase contrast is because you can tell what the phase shift is, we can actually tell the direction of flow. Right? Based on the orientation of the phase shift, we can tell whether the spins are moving one way along the gradient magnetic field or moving the other way along the gradient magnetic field, which can be very useful in some specific diagnostic situations. So for example, if you want to look at flow direction in the vertebral artery in someone who might have a subclavian steel, this is a way to do it non-invasively. Okay, but perhaps one of the, the most useful is that this technique has nothing to do with the T1 or apparent T1 of the blood. So if you think about that example I showed you earlier of the carotid dissection where we had that T1 shine through artifact where there was high signal in the blood vessel simply because of the presence of methemoglobin where there was very rapid relaxation and it had nothing to do with the presence of flow. That's not an issue here at all. If there's no motion there won't be any signal. All right. So. Okay, I'll sh I'm going to show you an example of that. One answer, the easy answer is, by knowing what it is you're interested in looking at. So that's maybe sort of a cop-out. The question is, how do you know <laughs> what velocity that is? So you could look it up, or you could just have experience as knowing what the velocity is, but I'll show you a way that we can actually do that. So these, first of all, these are source images from an MRA of the head using phase contrast techniques. So notice that you see signal from flow, but no background. So the background suppression is extremely good. What happened? This is what the MIP images look like. So the contrast to noise of flow relative to background is very good. Now notice in this image, for example, we're seeing relatively large arteries. We're not seeing it. This is the brain. We don't see any evidence of CSF flow in the cerebral aqueduct, which is much slower. We don't really see many veins, but we do see the transverse and part of the sagittal sinus. Okay. 
Now one thing about this, that's related to the flow velocity. Now this image is not a directionally encoded image. So this doesn't have any information about the phase of the spins and which direction flow is moving along the gradient magnetic field. All it does is show us the presence of flow at the velocity we've encoded or not. But notice that we see both arterial and venous flow. Flow in the superior sagittal sinus, that is not a good color, is going which way? Toward the feet. Arterial flow, like in the carotid, is coming up in this direction. Or in the basilar, it's coming out of the board toward you. And of course, in these vessels, we have all of this in-plane flow. We're not selective for flow moving one way or the other. In our time of flight MRA, we talked about this idea that you could, if you were interested in imaging the arteries in the head, for example, you could place a saturation pulse over the top of the head and saturate all of the signal from venous blood that was coming down. That's not going to have any effect on phase contrast because the phase contrast approach is showing us changes in phase that are locally within the image. It has nothing to do with what you do to the signal before it gets into the image. It has simply to do with the effect of spins moving along the gradient magnetic field within the image. Okay. So this is to answer Karen's question. So these are examples from a patient where we were interested in doing a CSF flow study. Right? So using phase contrast MRA to measure CSF flow or to demonstrate CSF flow. And we didn't know, or at least we pretended we didn't know, what was the correct velocity encoding to use. So in order to figure it out, we acquired a series of phase contrast images, each one at a different velocity encoding, which are what the numbers here mean in centimeters per second. And we did it in a way that these are relatively low resolution images and they don't take a lot of time for us to acquire. So if you watch the image, as you go to a higher and higher velocity encoding, you can see, for example, you don't see really any arteries at all in these first couple of images, but arterial flow is much more prominent later on. Okay. So you can do sort of a, an iterative process like this before you start your scan to, to get a sense of what would be the correct velocity encoding. Now this is an example of a CSF flow study. This is one from a couple of weeks ago that I did where we acquire our phase contrast angiogram. It, even though we're looking at CSF, it's all the same technique. And we choose the VANC, the velocity encoding, right, to match CSF. Which typically, by the way, is on the order of a few centimeters per second. Right, maybe three, maybe five. That would be a typical amount. Then what we do is hook the patient up to a cardiac monitor. CSF flow. Did I do that right? Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing that I could remember that. So the reason that we hook the patient up to a cardiac monitor, which is actually built into the scanner, is that we know that CSF flow changes based on the cardiac cycle. There are other things that influence it also, respiratory waveform, but the cardiac cycle causes us to see a change in CSF flow. And what we will do is image this patient, acquire a phase contrast image like this at multiple points during the cardiac cycle. Okay. Then, once we have all those individual images, we can play them 
Yes. My movie's not working. Hmm. Okay. Stay tuned. I'll bring my movie out after the break. <laughs> but we're able to show real-time CSF flow by looking at multiple images at different phases in the cardiac cycle. Okay? Now, if we look at this same person and hone in on one part of the anatomy, this is the cerebral aqueduct in the midbrain, right? we can look at, this is just an anatomic version of the image, this second row, this is just showing you a few slices, showing you that there is high signal on this gradient echo image because there's inflow into that slice. Same idea as the time of flight effect. This next row is what we call the magnitude image from our phase contrast MRA. It's just showing us where there is flow at the velocity that we have encoded, and that's why the aqueduct looks white. The little red circle is something that I drew on there. This next set of slices is showing you a phase image. And we have another one of those down here in the right. That's simply showing you the direction of flow extracted from this. And we can look at this <coughs> information quantitatively to determine right, what the flow velocity is within this structure based on the phase shift. Why do you need the cardiac cycle? Why do you need the I'm sorry? Why do you need an EKG or why do you need a cardiac monitor? Well, it depends on what kind of information you want. So if we want, I have to show you the movie, I guess. What we want to do is look at flow in real time. So the location of the CSF is going to, the distribution of flow, right, the what we're seeing here is over time, so we've acquired multiple scans over time during the cardiac cycle, and what I'm showing you is the quantitative velocity over that period of time. So what you can see is that during the cardiac cycle, at this location in the cerebral aqueduct, velocity starts out low, and then it increases, and then it falls off again. So if we want to show that dynamic flow, for example, in some pathologic states, in someone who has aqueductal stenosis, we might not detect this effect. There might be dampened range of velocities. Or if you look at somebody, for example, with a Chiari malformation, where you're looking at the foramen magnum, we can actually look in real time at how CSF and whether CSF seems to be flowing through the foramen magnum around the brainstem or are things so tight that CSF can't flow through there. So the only way you can get that information is by looking at a range of points in time. If we just imaged here, or if we imaged once and we randomly happened to end up looking at this at a point where there was naturally a low velocity because it was a lull in the cardiac cycle, we might, might misinterpret that piece of information. It's a problem, right? Typically, it's potentially a problem. Now, in a CSF flow study, it's less of a problem because we're typically only looking at, right, a inter we're only interested in a single iteration. But it really depends on, if you're averaging this over many cardiac cycles in order to get the information for all of your images, and there's an arrhythmia where things are all over the place, that, that's a problem. There are approaches to deal with that. There are things like uh, arrhythmia rejection where, you know, you can monitor. I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm not into cardiac that much. But there are ways to select from what was done only the pieces of information that occurred, you know, with the same pattern of, of cardiac cycle. Okay. This is an example from the lower extremity, which Ken Kane was kind enough to give to me, where we've done phase contrast imaging. And when we look at the magnitude of right, the presence of flow, we see this right, high signal. But if you notice, 
at these images, which are quantitative images, that there is a lower, right, it's harder to see this popliteal artery on your far right than it is on your far left. And in this image down here where we are quantifying flow, notice how unlike the cerebral aqueduct where it was all homogeneously white, I don't remember whether it was white or black, whatever the direction was, it was black, right? Here we have black with this white in the center, okay? So bla the black and white encoding is a directional encoding. What's going on here is that we have selected our vank based on what we thought the velocity would be. Right? And what that means is let's say we selected a velocity of 10 centimeters per second. So at a velocity of 10 centimeters per second, we would correctly dephase and rephase our flow. Right? We would cause, let's say, a an equal and opposite phase shift. So we would maximally bring back that signal. What happens if we have flow that is outside of that velocity? Right? If we have flow that's outside of that velocity, it will have a phase shift that is different. Right? And until now, the way we've been t discussing it, it would not dephase and rephase equally. But if we're off enough in our velocity, it might, right, dephase, right, and rephase, but in the, in the opposite direction. So when we talked about being able to get directional information about flow along this gradient magnetic field, what we're actually showing here is that the highest velocity flow in the center, which we didn't correctly encode, looks like it's going in the opposite direction. Okay. And this is what you would expect if you chose an incorrect velocity encoding. So that's why in this vessel, right, just like when we looked at the saturation of flow in the time of flight MRA, you're seeing an expression of laminar flow. There are lower velocities at the periphery and higher velocities at the center. So because we didn't choose our velocity encoding correctly, we are aliasing part of that velocity spectrum, so it looks like it's going in the opposite direction. Okay, and this is just a token cardiac example, right? So here's a gradient echo image on your far left, just a structural image. This is the phase contrast angio image, which simply shows us the presence of flow. If we look at the direction of the phase shift, though, which is what we're looking at on the far right, you can actually tell the direction of flow, right? Toward the head and the ascending aorta and toward the feet and the descending aorta.